we like to call it the supernatural hour. And now, our hosts. All right. Hey, we are back for a new episode of the Supernatural Hour. Um, I am your host, Castle. Um, with us is also Tim, a.k.a. Beaker. What's happening? We have got Deanne. And uh, no silent dawn today, no lurch today, but we've got a no fill. No peaches either. No peaches, but we had to get a fill in, and so we just decided that we would... Uh, we just kind of scraped around, see what we could do, and we have our fill-in, who is John Zaffis. How's it going? This episode is actually probably going to be a lot of us asking John questions and John expounding on his knowledge because John knows a lot of stuff. Stuff. It, stuff. John stuff. knows stuff. If only people could see like the big <laughs> grin on your face right now. It's like you're in heaven. If you want to know the best way to fertilize your lawn, we're going to talk to John because John knows just the way to keep the lawn green. <laughs> Buy some cows. Yeah, but no, they'll eat your lawn. The fertilizer. Yeah, they make natural fertilizer. That's a fun lot to go lay out on. <laughs> All right, so um, we are going to get started. We actually had an interesting, and I don't know if you've heard about this, John. Uh, we usually do a little segment on our show, and we kind of scour the internet for interesting paranormal stories. Mm-hmm. And we found one. It's a group. Um, I can't remember who, what they're called. Uh, look them up really fast, Tim, and I'll just fill time. Um, oh, th- we're good at doing this. <laughs> But they're a group. Be prepared. They prepared. What? They have kind of a traveling museum of cursed objects. Basically, these folks and uh, Tim's looking for, but he can't find it. Um, they had this idol that they're trying to scan, mm-hmm. and interestingly enough, in the video, their scanning equipment doesn't work. It's almost like there's an invisible force field in front of uh, this idol's face. Uh, but you know, the interesting thing, and we've talked about it before on the show before, and I think you're probably in line with this too, John is that really people screwing around handling that kind of stuff is probably not the wisest thing to be doing regardless. When, when dealing uh, with the haunted items, again, to, uh, you know, having something scanned, have it checked out to see if there's something within it, I think that's a cool idea because I have a lot of different items that I've never opened up to see if there's anything inside them. And I'd be curious too. But on the flip end of that, I'm always very guarded and very careful which people get involved with this. And um, the element to remember when dealing with haunted items, we deal with energy. Energy attaches to them, just like houses and land. So therefore, when we come in contact with those items and we're handling them, our energy can activate something that's with it. So I'm very guarded and very careful when dealing in the perspective of it. But for a person to study something, you know, scanning it or doing EVPs or, you know, trying to gain some type of knowledge off of something, I'm all for that. That that that's definitely how we're going to advance, how things are going to be able to move forward is by doing some of these different things to be able to check items out. But I'm very guarded, very careful with people just handling items and you know just having it in an open uh type of environment because i get very nervous because i energy is energy it can never be destroyed so therefore i you know rather be safe than sorry on my end so now i know that you actually have a museum is, mm-hmm. is your museum currently open or what's nope the, uh, the museum's a barn on my property uh it's a private museum uh, i would look i'm looking forward to it in the future on finding a location where it can be placed, where it can be opened up. Um, unfortunately, where I live, on one side I have a lawyer, the other side I have a doctor, and I don't really think they'd appreciate busfuls of people showing up and just, you know, tramping around in my yard and going in my barn. Yeah. <laughs> I, I Especially at right. night. Yeah, probably not. So let me ask you, and I'm, I've always been kind of a big fan of yours and what and your work. Um, I've also been a big fan of Ed and Rain Warren and, mm-hmm. and their work. In fact, we've actually patterned a lot of what we do based on your work and their work and try and uh, basically follow your guys' example. Mm-hmm. Um, now, with that, I know, for instance, uh, your Aunt Lorraine has Annabelle, which yes. is a very nasty, mm-hmm. creepy, raggedy Ann doll. Uh, in your collection, what do you have? Uh, what's probably your scariest, freakiest thing you got? And can you kind of tell us the story behind it? I think it's uh, similar to um, what uh, Ed and Lorraine had. had. It, it, it was a six-foot idol. I have a, like, two-foot one. 
and um, you know got a telephone call from a mom and dad and they were having all kinds of problems with their teenage son and I had gone over to investigate and um, you know typical teenagers the parents didn't go in his bedroom or anything like that and he was freaked out telling them it's up in his room and the three of us went up there and we found where he had an altar set up and he had this two foot idol in there amongst other different things and he said whatever I conjured up and whatever I brought in here now resides within there and it is telling me to kill myself so that was a, a pretty heavy duty type thing because there was a minister that was involved with it and um, he did what he needed to do and everything and um, as you know what my wacky sense of humor and everything i was just telling the minister you know well, why don't you take all that stuff he goes no that's your job he <laughs> says you take that stuff out he goes i don't even want to touch it mom and dad didn't even want to touch it but i had quite a bit of activity that took place over it uh since then i have it's encased um there's been a lot of bindings and prayers and uh different things that have been done over it um even though i'm roman catholic and um I'm very analytical, and what I mean by that is I work with all faiths, and that's a key essential thing because a lot of people out there aren't Roman Catholic. So getting involved with that, having a lot of friends, you know, whether it be a rabbi, a minister, or a priest, or anything, or a shaman, you know, they come over to visit. I make them work. They come over, and I'll say, hey, <laughs> do your prayers or do different things over the barn and a lot of the different things in there. So I'm very cautious with uh, quite a bit of it. You know, and it's interesting because on the ride over here, we talked about that. And there seems like these days, there's a lot of caution lacking, uh, especially if the millennials screw around with stuff that they shouldn't be screwing around with. They mm -hmm. don't have that caution. Have you noticed any kind of uptick uh, as far as calls to you to come deal with stuff uh, with some of the later generations? Yes. I think one of the uh, key issues that I'm seeing is a lot of people are collecting and collecting haunted items is a, a huge, huge thing today. And people bring them in and, you know, they have them in their home. And it's something that I, I'm not comfortable with because I've dealt with several people already that are collectors where they end up getting sick. They start having bad luck. They have all these different things. And, you know, and I'll explain to them a lot of times you, you're bringing this into your personal environment. I said, you, you, you have to have a safe zone, safe zone, and I believe very strongly in that. So with the people really getting involved with the collecting and everything, I'm seeing people really taking it upon themselves, bringing that stuff in and not really doing anything with it, and it's wreaking havoc in a lot of people's lives. Now, uh, <clears throat> with, and I agree, I, I think having that stuff... I'm actually going to interrupt you because I read a, I read something interesting today. Um, there's a, a second famous person that um, committed suicide today, and I <clears throat> was reading you know a little article about it, and in it it said um, that as of late the last I can't remember the last few years there has been an increase in suicides in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, how much of that do you think might be related to you know what you said about that idol of the kid killing himself? And I, I know it's hard to say specifics, but mm -hmm. do you think that could be an issue with people bringing haunted things into their homes? Wow. That's a loaded question. Yes, it is. <laughs> I don't talk much, but when I do. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but, but when uh, she does, we try and mute her as quick as we can. Yeah. Who are you and what have you done with DM? <laughs> do, do I feel, you know, uh, with types of situations where people are collecting and bringing things in that it can influence them and cause depression? Absolutely. Um, do I feel that the rate of what we're seeing with people today with the suicide rate and a lot of it doesn't really add up to a, a lot of different things I, I i feel a lot of times people underestimate depression they underestimate you know mental illness and you know bipolar and schizophrenia and a lot of times these people suffer in silence and i'm a very big advocate of uh, people coming forward because there's such a stigma with these uh, types of illnesses that people go through and they don't seek out help and they could end up, you know, just committing suicide. Absolutely. We hear about this, you know, a lot more today, especially very wealthy, you know, celebrity people and, you know, they just 
because they can no longer uh, function because they're afraid to really do anything or move into the forefront. But on the flip end of it, do I think that paranormal can influence some of these situations and cause something to escalate? Yes, I do believe that. So uh, along with, uh, you kind of mentioned that in your barn you've got all the stuff you've collected. Mm -hmm. um, but how many items do you think at this point you, that you store in there? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> now, the, the funny thing is, and every once in a while I'll just throw a photo up, and um, it, it, the barn looks like an episode out of Hoarders. <laughs> it's, that's how bad it's really gotten, where boxes are just piled up. And, you know, the running joke now is that they want to do a TV show with me just opening up a box and starting to talk about the item. Because there's, there's like years worth of boxes that I have never opened. Be like Hoarders, the, the John Zaffis. Yeah. yeah, Paranormal Hoarder. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that was that's one of my key things with wanting to get the museum located in a uh, situation where it can continue to after I'm gone. I'm going to go ahead and just volunteer at Tim's house. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> so, you know, it, to honestly even tell you how many items I have in there, I don't know because a lot of times it's like being a kid in a candy store. I'll walk by one of the boxes and, geez, I never even opened that one. Look at the post date on it and go, oh, it's been sitting there for about four or five years. I think I better open it. And every once in a while, I'll do that, and I'll just post a picture, and people go, how can you do that? How could you have all these boxes just sitting there and not even open them? Because a lot of times with me, I'm more interested in helping the people than I am the item. As much and as crazy as that sounds. Right, and if the item's with you, it's not with the people. Yeah, so. you know, so it's sitting there. It's not bothering anybody, you know, so therefore, a lot of times, I just look at it that way, and, and as long as I know... There's no issues with where it came from and everything. I, eh, leave it alone. There's, but, you know, that's whether that's a good move or a bad move, I don't know. <laughs> you know it's interesting to say that because we've said it multiple times. In fact, Dan just said it to me the other day, and that's that honestly helping people is probably the most rewarding part of being involved in the paranormal. That's why we do what we do is we like to go into a home and mm -hmm. help resolve a problem. Mm -hmm. So with all the stuff that you've got in the barn, mm -hmm. um, have you ever had any activity bleed over into the home or do crazy things happen in the barn at night what kind of what kind of things have you experienced having all that stuff on your property i don't have much activity in the house i've never really had anything major happen in the house human spirit you know relatives here and there every once in a while will pop up but to me i don't even consider that a haunting or anything usually if they're around there's a reason because i believe very strongly in that our deceased ones come back to uh give us information or to help us out the barn itself people go in there they get evps they get crazy pictures they get all kinds of crazy things i mean it's like eh, I, I i'm very numb to a lot of stuff now yeah. so, so i i just it takes something major for me to really like go ooh, 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 ooh. you know like a really good history story that ties in with something or there's something major that transpires and then i'll 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 pay more attention to something because I look back and I do the same thing. I used to get so mad at my uncle because a lot of times when I would get scared or something or jump, he would just sit there and smile, wouldn't move, wouldn't react. Well, guess what? I do the same thing now when, when there's people with me, they'll jump, they'll move, they'll go, and everything. And I, I just sit there and smile and I go, oh man, I turned into my uncle. I, you know, I do the same thing now. It really takes a lot to get me to once you've been there once you've been involved with it so much i look at it from the flip end that so much when it comes into worrying about the evidence i'm not so concerned about it anymore I'm like, okay what do i need to do to be able to help that person can i help that person that, that that's the way i look at it now when i get involved with an investigation it's kind of funny that you say that because we actually had an investigation a couple months ago where uh we had, the, it was a family tree restaurant I told you about, the place that's really dark, it's a little dark restaurant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was upstairs and down the basement. Uh, my wife and another group actually saw a really dark entity down there and there were screams and uh, 
I, I got. Oh, I was right there when that happened. I, I got in a little bit of trouble for not being more concerned. <laughs> I, I got talked to, so I, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it, it took me about a week, week and a half to to get to, out to of not it. be in trouble anymore. <laughs> So, if you can, John, and I know you've probably got like a thousand and one stories, can you tell us some of the more interesting stories that you've run across over your years of doing this? I think uh, I always try to look at things that are different when people ask me different stories and um, different things because uh, as, um, again, being involved with the demonology end of this field, that's how I, you know, over the years got involved with that before being known for the haunted collector you know trying to comprehend it and understand that how these things could occur how how can they happen was an element that i needed to understand so i was fortunate enough where you know ed and lorraine warren knew everybody and their brother in the world so rabbis ministers priests shamans and i would get to meet all those people when this stuff wasn't fashionable you know you just didn't talk about it you didn't bring it out to the forefront but that was probably an element that helped me to understand it, watching a rabbi getting involved with this, watching what how they perform their things to be able to help people, watching priests, watching a shaman do different things. And I would collectively try to understand and comprehend and study what I can about each and different religion out there and came back and one day I remember sitting, I was talking with Ed and I go, it's all fascinating. It's all intriguing watching what all the different religions do to be able to help people. And I said, at that point, I said, if all these religious, spiritual people believe in all this stuff and they help all these different people and get involved with all this, there's really something to all that. Because at that point in time, I still really, I was in my 20s. I really hadn't had any type of a major, major experience with anything. So that that's what led me down going that path. And Today, when I look back at it, I, uh, it's when you witness a person levitating or seeing their eyes change, uh, people getting scratched, people getting bit in front of you, watching furniture or things move around, and those elements all tie in that we know we're dealing with something that's definitely on a negative level, I look at it totally differently is the best way I, I can explain it to you. You know, I'm no different than anybody else. It's, you see that, you witness that. And then it takes me a couple of days to process something. And then all of a sudden I'll just go, that happened. That literally happened. It wasn't the imagination. Several people just witnessed that, including myself. So then you have to reevaluate the way you look at a lot of different things. So when talking about that, and leading up to, you know, some of the more horrific things that you see, I, I think possession is one of the heavy duty aspects of this. I, when it comes into a lot of that, I don't talk about a lot of those cases I've been involved with to this day that I still work on. Um, I try to keep it to a point where it's more getting involved with helping that individual are helping out a spiritual or clergy friend of mine more than me going, ooh, 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 I got the next biggest case that just hit. I I don't really look at it that way anymore. It's funny because I just just don't. I go, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. And when I experience anything or have anything bizarre happen, okay, here's a brand new one I'll share with you. Uh, I got an email from a young man. It starts telling me about this 212-year-old farmhouse and just gave me a very short description of some of the activity that was transpiring. I'm sitting there and I'm reading this email. This was just this past weekend. And I'm like, something about this. Something intrigued me. I didn't know the you know, name or anything like that. And um, So I called the young man. I got on the phone with him and I'm talking to him going back and forth. And I go, okay, so I'll meet you up there. And it was about an hour away from my home, and he lived closer. He was trying to help this gentleman out that bought the piece of property. And we had so much activity that transpired in there with the three of us just sitting there, uh, voices and bangings and rappings and all this uh, stuff going on that was happening in the house. And I was still just sitting there going, 
okay, all right, I don't like that. And I'm watching this poor guy that owned this house. He's just, just sitting there and he's like this, just trembling. And I just looked across and I go, well, I said, you definitely got to haunt that house. And he goes, you think? <laughs> and I go, yeah. And he goes, well, what are we going to do about it? And this is what leads me to the next part of it. And I says, well, right now I have to evaluate a lot of things. So I need to find out what's going on with your property. I really don't know that much about you. I said, I don't know. You know, there's a lot that has to go into this. I can't just, you know, dial 911 exorcist and they're going to come right out and clean your house for you. Terminix. So, yeah. Ter yeah. <laughs> so that was interesting because uh, it was just something random. It was something that I just spontaneously had done. And I always tell people, you have some of the greatest experiences with dealing with anything in the paranormal when it's just random, when it's least expected. That's when I think some of the most phenomenal type things occur and happen with individuals. Oh, absolutely. I think when I go in and I, you know, when I first started ghost hunting, I wanted to see apparitions and I wanted to see things move. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and at some point I thought, okay, you know, that's not going to happen. We'll just go and try the EVPs. And the most interesting things have happened to me when I've been, you know, caught off guard. Mm -hmm. When you least expect yep. it. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say, and I've actually talked about it on the show before, but I actually had a night when I was at work, um, you know, and I work in law enforcement and I actually was taking a... A mental patient to a hospital um, and it was the middle of the night uh, I had the mental patient standing probably three or four feet in front of me and I had a gal at the reception desk probably another three or four foot in front of him and nobody behind me nobody on any side of me but right in my left ear I heard just loud and plain as day a voice just kind of mumble I couldn't understand the words mm -hmm. but it was just a and I mean it was just as plain as could be I actually had a my phone with me so I heard and shot a picture over my back and uh, one of the mediums we work with uh, she can actually see things in photographs mm -hmm. and so in fact Tim was with her that night and I just sent the photograph and said is there anything in this photo and she goes yeah there's a, a man about this age standing right over your left shoulder right where I'd heard that mm -hmm. and again it was I wasn't even doing anything paranormal related at all it was just me mm -hmm. paying attention to what was going on around me kind of thing and I think a lot of people have those kind of experiences every single day, but they just dismiss it, don't realize what it was. And uh... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you, like I said, you, 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 I, I feel we become very, I or I have become very desensitized to a lot of things. And I think you'll appreciate this quote that I use often. And I always say the best analogy I could ever tell you, if you ever talk to a doctor or a nurse, a fireman or a cop, the horror and the gore and everything they deal with all day long and a lot of them are able to you know just leave work and they're able to shut off they're able to shut it down or they can't coexist you know in, in a normal atmosphere with their family and everything i said well i think i have learned to ha uh, do something very similar to that because i can just shut everything right down and just block everything right out and walk back into the house and it's nothing to do with paranormal whatsoever so I think it's a key element to be able to do that because today I find too with a, a lot of people getting involved with our field uh, with the fascination of it it's 24 7 in their lives and that's not a healthy thing everything is paranormal then that it, it's yeah it, it's just not a healthy thing and I discourage that with people Oh, I do too. We've I'm, I've seen several people. There's a, a public uh, Facebook page for uh, paranormal people here in Utah, and I've seen people talk about how they're constantly doing like EVP sessions in their house, and and how just like everything they're doing in their life is just like 24 seven, like you said, just trying to find uh, paranormal activity. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you completely. Like that's never investigate your own home. That's like our number one rule. Like mm -hmm. don't go looking for it. Um, we you know we're in the same we have the same uh, mind frame where we're just trying to help people mm -hmm. uh, cope with what's going on in their homes and try to remove whatever's keeping them from being afraid to be in their own house. Or find the root problem with the family that may be causing it and trying to help them if they're willing to solve that root problem. Because yeah. uh, that's kind of the key in a lot of these is to figure out what the root problem is mm -hmm. and deal with it. Because if they're not willing to address the root problem, you can come in with sage, shamans, priests, etc., and do stuff and things will be fine for a day or a week but then it's right back to where it was before if not worse 
unless you can kind of get to the bottom of what the root issue is. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is a key thing, and I'm kind of glad you brought that up. Um, because I always go look at that old saying that the, we always say you can always lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink it. So with a lot of people today, there's a big fascination with keeping the haunting going. They want to keep everything going. They want that haunting there. They want this, you know. And I'll hear a lot of times from people that are being sincere, trying, but I just want to help them. You can't. You know, we've had a few cases like yeah. that where we've actually just finally said, hey, you know, yes. con contact your local clergy, but there's nothing more that we can do for you at mm -hmm. this time. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's because we know, well, we had one case, uh, like there's probably, I think Tim would describe it as probably one of the scariest cases we ever had. Uh, well, anytime you go into a home where there's a uh, loaded firearm just laying against the wall and the guy is, you know, writing down on a piece of paper perfect Latin that he hears chanting in his head. Um, yeah, I'm going to say that's probably one of the scariest things we've been involved with. Yeah, we actually have a team uh, member who speaks Latin, and this guy doesn't, this kid was just kind of a bumpkin, but he's writing down on paper. This one is ours, priest, over and over and over on paper. Uh, the more we got into it, we kind of figured out that he was using a Ouija board on almost a daily basis. And it's one of those that after we kind of got to the bottom of it, we're like, we can't help you. You, he basically wanted it there. Um, it's, that would be a type of situation where I'd walk around and look and I'd be, okay, what are you looking for? And I can tell you, I probably would have made a decision right there and then at that point in time, I'm not putting my team members in jeopardy. I'm not putting anybody in jeopardy because if you're willing and able to move forward, you usually can tell. You know, psychology 101 in our field isn't difficult. You, you know, you, you get used to it and dealing it, dealing with people. And you usually could tell immediately. And I think another thing that makes me very nervous and throws up a big red flag. And I think it does what a lot of us, no matter where we are, is that when you start finding out people have 14 and 15 different paranormal groups in their house, nothing's working. They can't figure nothing out. And I'll sit there and I'll go. I don't think I'm accepting that. I, I really don't. Because you're not going to tell me, regardless of whether I know them or not, that you had 14 or 15 different groups in and out of your house and nobody can find anything on uh, what exactly is going on. Something's not lining up right. And that tells me usually the individual wants to keep the haunting going. Because everybody thinks they're going to get a movie and a book deal today. Well, and I think there's a certain level of... Uh attention seeking there you know I, mm -hmm. I, i'm in a profession and anybody who's listening to this podcast knows what my profession is um where we deal with some of the same people over and over and over mm -hmm. and i don't want to make light of suicide because it's a very serious thing we've talked about it but you mm -hmm. deal with those people who every two or three weeks what was me i'm going to end it all and you get talking to them and you realize that it's just you know look at me i, I want the attention and i think you see the same thing mm -hmm. in the paranormal field is look at me i want the attention in fact it's funny because as you mentioned that i looked at tim because we have had a couple cases where it seems like we've been out there umpteen times uh you know and there's some that have just been legitimately tough problems that we've managed to help them work through but there's been some where in fact i think we've even had members of the team say i think they just kind of like the attention mm -hmm. uh, well, we've had uh, cases that we've been involved in where they've tried to collect their own evidence and they post it on Facebook to mm -hmm. say, hey, look, I've got ghosts. Because mm -hmm. for that exact reason, it's like it makes them feel important or special somehow. Look that at me. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of have to, in a way, um, I admire. We had one client, um, and after we got down to the bottom of it, you know, we figured that she had just taken meth like an hour before we got there. And we basically <laughs> told her, you remember this? Yeah. Yeah, and we basically said, um, you know, we can't help you because we could get out what you've got now, but you know, the next time you do a hit, it's going to be back, and mm -hmm. we'll, you know, we'll be back here every week. And so, you know, we said, until you get clean, don't call us back. And that's been what a couple of years ago. Yeah, she hasn't called us back. Yeah, and, and until <laughs> like you, two summers ago. Until you deal with the addiction and mm -hmm. your mom's girlfriend, who's using a Ouija board on a daily basis in the mm -hmm. house, there's nothing that we can do that's going to last for. So, and I don't know, maybe, maybe day, she's maybe. been, maybe she's been calling 14 other groups, but <laughs> <laughs> which <laughs> usually, that's usually what ends right. up happening, but she hasn't called us back. Mm -hmm. So yeah, again, yeah, yeah. I think it's important 
whether it's our field or any field, we have to uh, evaluate like a doctor or anybody. And okay, there's only so much you can do because we're in the field to be able to help individuals bring them the knowledge, but it's up to them to make a decision on whether they want that haunting to come to an end or not. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that, and that's kind of what we've experienced as well. Well, I think some people have just been around it or exposed to it so much throughout their entire lives that they feel like, that it's possible that they feel like if we get rid of it or if it leaves their home, that they're somehow less of a person. Does well, that make sense? And I think there's also a familiarity. You grow up with that, and then suddenly it's gone, and It's like a piece of you is missing. And so you want well, it Well, it is. It is. Wow, good topic, guys. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. When... You deal with an individual that has had paranormal experiences ever, ever since they were a child. That's a part of their lives. That's a part of them. They move into different houses. Everything's, every house is always haunted. It's not the houses, it's the person. So then when a lot of times with these individuals and they're able to be cleared, you know, they're able to be freed of what is attached to them. And a key element is they have to fill that void with something else. Just like a recovering drug addict, alcoholic, all these different things. It's just, I use the same analogy with that. You know, whether it is getting involved with a hobby or, you know, sitting around doing kumbaya, whatever's going to work. You know, that's going to fill that void for that individual. That's a key element. And a lot of times then I could see those people moving forward. But... I will say this, you know, at least eight out of 10 times when a person is freed from having that spirit with them, they feel a loss. They feel they're not no longer getting any information. They're not getting the attention and therefore they'll invite it right back in again. Well, and we've seen that too. Like we've mm -hmm. had people that we've helped to where after we've kind of, you know, got that out of their lives mm -hmm. they turn around and, and ask if they can be a part of our team and go and investigate with us and don't you love it yeah don't you love we've, it yeah. we've turned so many people down it's like yeah no that's yeah. it's not yeah. safe for you it's not safe for us it's yeah. not safe for our clients yeah, yeah i say you know i'm fantastic people and i count most of them friends because we usually mm -hmm. are friends with most of our clients when we're done mm -hmm. but yeah like tim said it's like no we just got that stuff out of your life that's mm -hmm. the last thing we want to do is put you in a situation where it's going to come back in and but be they for feel us. more qualified. <laughs> well, it's like our friends uh, at Bear River Paranormal. Uh, Shane was telling about a case that they worked on where they got that negative entity um, out of this girl's life. And then three months later, she was at a public investigation and just brought it right back in. Mm -hmm. And it's like people don't realize that. They're like, there's, there's something that, you know, just anything, any little thing can bring that stuff back into your life and it's not something that you should go looking for it's not like people think that that's what we do and it's not we're not actively seeking spirits we're being contacted by people that have legitimate problems and we're going and trying to help them the best we can and it's not for the woo wee factor i mean i get plenty of that on a daily basis right. without mm -hmm. needing we've, to mm. we've actually got a case in the works this fellow um super nice guy and um we know what his issues are and i don't want to air him now since we're um you know, it's a, he's a current client, but, um, he was expecting us to come in get rid of it and everything would be fine. And he, there's a few things that he's going to have to do to keep it gone. Mm -hmm. And we actually have our second, we're going to go visit him, um, again next week. And mm -hmm. this is the, and I told him, I said, you know, we're probably going to be having to come back a couple of times because I knew he wasn't ready to, to purge his issues. Mm -hmm. And this next visit is going to have to be a little bit of a come to Jesus and say, okay, you know, honestly, here's what the problem is. And you're going to have to make a decision mm -hmm. one way or the other, um, you know, before this will go and stay gone. So mm -hmm. and we've had will, several of those discussions with clients. And unfortunately, it's like usually when we have that conversation with them, we never hear back from them. We've had like a couple that they've they finally, you know, realized, hey, yeah, I need to change things in my life. And they call us back for help. But I'd say a good majority of the people that we say, hey, you know what? You need to change this around in your life. They for whatever reason decide that they want to just keep doing that and they don't they don't really want to get rid of the problem mm. I, that, that's more of an issue today than i've ever seen before I, it's just something uh, I, I have to take that step back and and look at it and realize that it's not gonna make any difference on whether you go there 10 times or you don't this person's just 
it's just not they're just not going to let anything go. They're not going to let it go. So therefore, a lot of times making that decision to uh, just move forward and be involved with something else because, you know, I the one thing I always get a big amazement out of is a lot of times somebody will call me, you know, that I know that has a parent or group or anything. Okay. They just told us you want nothing to do with them, blah, blah, blah. You were there and everything. And they go, we know you better. You don't walk away unless there's a legitimate reason for you to walk away. And I go, yeah, you want to go hang out there, do your EVPs and, you know, try to catch orbs or do whatever it is you want. Knock your socks off and go ahead. I said, but I'm too busy with trying to help people that want the help, not just go and entertain somebody. The other thing I find today, too, is I don't. I quite understand it if you know you're dealing with a family and they have you know a couple of little children and everything and you tell them you're coming over to investigate I, a lot of times i'll bring a few team members with me you show up and it's like they're having a party yeah. they invite all these people in the neighbors are showing up all their friends are showing up they're cooking they're doing this what is going no i'm not here for a party i'm here to help you you know, I, I laugh that you say that because we actually had to put a disclaimer on our website when you request an investigation mm -hmm. that we don't want the party. We've actually specifically said yeah. we want the people involved in the home, mm -hmm. and that's it. Because we've had the same thing where, mm -hmm. hey, we show up and they've got 10 people there. Yeah. There was yeah. four of us and 20 of them. Correct. <laughs> yeah, li literally on one investigation. Mm -hmm. It was it was a considerable drive to get there. Mm -hmm. Well, in one of my favorite investigations where we just had some really incredible evidence and, and communication, you know, live communication through the K2 meters, um, we got nothing. I mean, nothing was happening, mm -hmm. um, but, like, the dad was there. You know, the dad of the client, Grandpa, mm -hmm. was there. And he was very much a skeptic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oh, this, is, this is dumb, this is crap, this isn't real. And we sat there for probably 45 minutes with nothing, and um, he finally left. No sooner did the door shut, boom, you know, all the K2s lit up, and we mm -hmm. were able to ask yes, no questions, mm -hmm. and... That's what I call a neutralizer. <clears throat> yep. You always have to, a lot of times you'll have one person, even in, in our paranormal groups, I hear this continuously a lot of times, well, so-and-so will come, and everything... Nothing's happening. She leaves, and all of a sudden, all the activity kicks up. I said, well, there's always, you know, uh, an individual, a lot of times in a family environment or in the, you know, in the group environments, and I refer to them as neutralizers. We refer to them as Nate Alder. <laughs> just, just, or, just kidding, Nate. Or Silent Don. Sometimes, in fact, he, he knows that he is. That's my husband. And sometimes he'll say, you know, I'll go... And, you know, I'll step out anymore. He will stay in the front room, you know, with the homeowners and explain what's going on while we're back in the home doing things because mm -hmm. he knows that he knows that he's the neutralizer. So, mm -hmm. so let me ask you. Let's get kind of into the possession end of things. Mm -hmm. um, now, when there's a possession, and we've witnessed uh, some over the course of our doings, mm -hmm. um, and I know that when you experience those, you usually have them evaluated by a mental, a mental health professional. Correct. Um, let me ask you this. How does that work as far as, you know, contacting a psychologist and saying, hey, yo, is this person possessed? Uh, it kind of explain to me your process when you get somebody who you think you're dealing with a possession. The immediate process is if I do feel that there is, quote unquote, the possibility of true possession. Today, we're fortunate because it's a, we live in a different environment today. And what I mean by that is. Nine out of 10 people, oh, I'm hearing voices. Oh, this is happening. What do they do? They run to the doctors automatically. They, you know, so a lot of times the groundwork is already done. So, and I find that a lot of therapists, psychologists, a lot of them look and they try to take it into consideration. Not necessarily that they'll believe in it. But all, a lot of them that I deal with will come back and just tell me, I don't know what to think. I can't diagnose this individual with anything. Therefore, it falls out of the rain, you know, realm of anything I could come up with. And a lot of times then they'll just say uh, off the record, I don't believe in this stuff, but there's something with that person and I don't want them back in my office. I hear this continuously a lot of, you know, from a lot of them. They, they look at it differently today. Me, I've been fortunate because I've worked with so many psychologists and therapists and different things that a lot of times, if they're not, well, who's John's office? I don't know who he is. And 
a lot of times if I'm speaking to them, I'll say, well, I've worked with so-and-so, you know, in your realm of uh, expertise in, in that end where they'll chit-chat back and forth and, you know, they'll be a little bit more willing to try and work with an individual or try to understand what is going on because, you know, okay, is there something happening on a, a level there from that process that they can't evaluate or they can't come to a conclusion with and a lot of times i'll just chuckle and go okay then we're probably dealing with some paranormal you know get more involved with it at that point but with anything before i'll and i always say true possession because there's so many different levels that you know i watch and see that people get involved with and it really has nothing to do with true possession whatsoever but you know um lost my train of thought where was i going with that one the difference between <laughs> true possessions and... oh yeah the true possession <laughs> so he looked at me for the question well, I, say, I, I was just thinking cool i don't feel bad because i do that on this podcast all the time <laughs> it, you know it's important to rule out mental illness bipolar schizophrenia all these things have to be ruled out and it's a critical thing you know what medic medications are all these people on what's environment what are they practicing what are they doing all of that before I'm going to actually take that step forward and say that there's something legitimately happening here. Now, don't get me wrong. This stuff can mask behind some of that stuff. So it's important to really dig in and find out as much as you possibly can. And there are those times where, you know, I have known people that they're on all kinds of medications and everything else and nothing's working. The medications aren't working, blah, 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 blah. Would I say at that point, I'm willing to take that chance and say, let's get help in here on a spiritual level? Yes. Have I seen it help individuals? Yes. But I've seen other people where I've taken that chance and made that decision and it really didn't do anything whatsoever. So, so now you mentioned true possession. Uh, are there different levels of possession and what would you describe those or how would you call those? When... We deal with true possession. I mean, there's diff we have the three different categories. We have, you know, where we look at it, where we have the infestation. And it's where it's moving into the person's life and it's altering them. They can't sleep, they can't eat, they can't, you know, uh, really take that point and go back and forth with it. And then, you know, just jumping right to what I re refer to as true possession. True possession is probably one of the most difficult things to deal with. And the reason being is if a person, quote unquote, is truly possessed, spirit can go in and out of that individual. So therefore, if this person's got these legitimate issues going on and they're doing a deliverance or an exorcism and nothing's working, there's no reaction, that's because that, that, that spirit actually left the body and then it can go back in. That's what I call true possession. And you really got to dig in and do what you can to uh, try and have it at that same time framing where you tricked it and the spirit is still with the individual. Not, not me. I won't do an exorcism, but I let spiritual people do that. I'm crazy. I'm not stupid. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that takes on too much burden on you on a spiritual level. But, um, you know, watching spiritual people being able to do that and, and bring it to the forefront where it is within the, the physical body and they're able to free that individual. I've seen that happen and work and be successful. On those cases though, do, are there steps that they have to take to avoid having further issues down the road? Meaning the people? Yeah. Absolutely. I feel when dealing with that and a person is legitimately freed they need to fill that void like we were talking earlier you know take up a hobby i don't care if you start knitting crocheting do something get involved with other things um, it's an important element for them to fill that void because they're going to continuously think about it then they're going to start missing it they're going to miss that information and I tried to explain that uh, to them continuously. You know, on the flip side of it, and it's funny, but it's really not funny, is that 
A few years back, we used to try to set up support groups for all these people that went through this. Well, what ended up happening was it turned into a competition. Well, my spirit was stronger than your spirit, and this one did down, and needed it. And I'm like, you just defeated the whole purpose of doing the group to, you know, get you guys together to be able to move forward, and it just turned into a whole competition. So I just looked at them, there was like seven of them, and I'm like, forget it. Nothing I could do here. Everybody lick your hand and slap your own face and get out of here. <laughs> because I remember I was sitting in on one of the one of their little kumbaya moments and well this one did that and that one did that and then and now this happened in my house and that I'm like you just defeated the whole purpose of doing this. You did, totally defeated it. Can you, if you're willing to, tell us your most frightening experience that you have had in the paranormal? I think I know what it is, but I think it's, you know he's I been think trying it's, to get that out of me. I think it's happening right show. now. No. I think this I is this is the scariest moment in his life when the paranormal is talking to us. He's seeing the duct tape in the corner. And the <laughs> He's like, as soon as that blue jeep pulled up in front of the hotel, <laughs> the, to, I was scared. I think, the, <laughs> I think, you know, when I take that step back, and it's 30 years ago, was the haunting in Connecticut. It was a very traumatic case for me. You know, it was where you witnessed something and you experienced something, and the way it legitimately happened was the fact that I was sitting in the dining room and I was just jotting down some notes and uh, had gotten up. The house got very cold, it was August. Looked up the staircase and it was this just transparent, huge, stinky thing, smelled terrible, started forming and it started coming down the staircase and it said, do you know what they did to us? Do you know what they did to us? And everybody was sound asleep at that point. I was the only one awake. And it just rocked my world that night. Totally rocked my world. And the tail end of it is more funnier than what's ever been on TV. Uh, because then at that point, I started screaming and yelling, mother effing everything up and down, fell over a coffee table. At that point, everybody finally started waking up. They're trying to grab me. And I'm like, I don't want nothing to do with all you freaking people. I don't want nothing to do with any of this stuff anymore. And for three days, I wouldn't talk to anybody. I, I le legitimately would not talk to anybody. And we were very fortunate. Uh, a bishop friend of the family uh, called me up and, you know, Bish, I'm done with this stuff. I want nothing to do with this. F this. I'm done. Ba 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 ba. I'm going on. And he goes, Are you done now? And I go, Yeah. He goes, Are you going to let it win? And going, What are you talking about? He goes, Its intent and purpose was to scare you so you wouldn't do the work and help people anymore. I'm like, oh, Bish, you got to put it that way, don't you? Damn it. <laughs> so, and he was right. You know, I, I did agree with him, and I knew everything was set up. Everything was sanctioned to be done. And I did go back into uh, the Southington home, and um, everything was performed, and it was very successful. And uh, shortly after that, uh, Carmen and Al Snedeker had moved out of that house, and I have never been back in that house since. I just, not that I think the house is still haunted. I do think the house is cleared. I really do. I don't know because I haven't been in it, but I just don't want to relive that moment. Did they ever figure out what the root problem was in that particular home? There were several different um, things that transpired with that piece of property. And it, it just got so complicated. And it just got so involved with things that they uh, felt transpired and occurred in there that they felt that you know there was one of the as you know it was a former funeral home they felt uh that uh again with some of the different things that the family was able to get a hold of and a few other people is that there, there was a particular employee that worked there and he was performing uh, necrophilia on some of the uh deceased people that were living there and it, again it just got to a point where it just got so sketchy and so crazy and so involved on a legal end that you just don't go too deep into too much of that i, I don't because i just don't want to deal with it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't you, it just gets too crazy but we do i do feel that that, that was one of the uh, one of the major factors that contributed to something and what carmen's oldest son you know, going through the cancer and the treatments and everything, it was just like a perfect storm. Because the, the, that house had sat 
vacant, the lower level of it, for uh, quite a few years before Carmen and her family had moved in there. And I think it was just like, when they moved in there, it just, it, it triggered it. Philip triggered everything. You know, it's, it, and it's kind of a tragic ending uh, with, with that whole case, because I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but uh, Philip ended up passing away several years ago. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, unfortunately, um, you know, he was always a tormented young man. Um, he always had a lot going on. It was very difficult for him. And um, it was just a, a very sad, sad thing where he had uh, passed away a few years back. Was it the cancer that got him or just something it, else entirely? It, a lot of things uh, ended up contributing. A lot of things ended up happening. And, you know, uh, so much takes its toll on you. Um, one of the contributing factors were, too, that the... Um, uh, they felt that the cancer did come back. Yeah, cancer's not fun. I know that several of our team members have dealt with that mm -hmm. on a different level. Currently dealing with it. Yes, exactly. All right, well, we will call that an episode uh, just so we can get you back and the, the organizers who brought you to Utah don't hurt us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we appreciate you coming down. It's been a fantastic, interesting talk. I honestly, I don't know about Tim or Deanne, but I could probably go for five more hours just to ask a question. Well, thanks I, for having me on. I just want to mention real quick, since we did talk about uh, suicide and whatnot today, and um, I know a lot lately. With I know Radio Ronan's mentioned it before, but we just want to make sure all of our listeners are aware that if you are having problems and need someone to talk to, you're more than welcome to reach out to any of the hosts of the Pod Bash Network, and we'll help the best that we can. If we can't help you, we'll get you uh, the number to a helpline. We'll get you the help you need, basically. We're yeah. here for you guys. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I particularly deal with it on a personal level through work, so I it's something I've had a lot of experience with. It takes a toll on all the people around you, including people like me who come out and deal with it. But please reach out. Talk to us. We'll, If all it takes is one of us talking to you for a while, we'll talk to you for a while. We don't have an issue with that if it'll help. Uh, so reach out. Anyway, thank you for listening. Help. You can also go to advancedparanormal.com. There'll be a link there for tickets. Um, come out, say hi to us, come investigate with us, uh, come get you some EVPs, and I think we'll call that a show. You've been listening to The Supernatural Hour at advancedparanormal.com. The Supernatural Hour is part of the Radio Ronin Network, found at radioronin.com. Copyright 2021 by Advanced Paranormal Services.